Bloodborne. The next one in the series of Souls games that I've been covering for the last while now. I have adored every single Souls game from FromSoft that I played until now, and today is no difference. I played Bloodborne for the Platinum Trophy to really get a feel for it. And I have done that, and I feel like I have a feel for the game. Bloodborne is, in no short terms, fantastic. I can't say anything somebody else hasn't said before. This game is fun, it is satisfying, it is bloody, it is eldritch horror at its peak. It is really good. Everywhere from the voice acting to the world to the feel of combat, everything has something. And Bloodborne has literally everything that every game should have. It is fun in combat, it has great exploration, it has great weapons, and it has some completely new and unique mechanics that for some reason never have been used again. So let's talk a little bit about it, and let's get right into it. Bloodborne is a great game, no doubt about that, and there are a lot of different reasons why people love them. So if I don't mention the reason why you like it, and I don't mention it here, it's not because I don't agree, it's just because there's a lot, and I'm gonna mention the things that means the most to me, that I, for me, you know, really hit home. To start off with, I wanna talk about a couple of the new mechanics, then I wanna talk about the story, and then probably also delve into a little bit of lore and the theme surrounding that, and then I want to delve into how I feel like in comparison what it does so fucking well at the end. Specifically because I believe, and I don't mind sharing that now, that Bloodborne teaches you how to be better at Souls, period, and how to make the games more fun. Which to me is a really important note to that. So, let's just start talking about the new mechanics. Now, when it comes to Bloodborne, it cannot be denied that Bloodborne has a lot of new mechanics. Well, it has two major ones that people keep mentioning and one that's also new that's just not as good. So let's start with the bad one and just get Chalice Dungeons out of the way. Challenge Dungeons are, if you have played Elder Ring, literally the cave system in Elder Ring, but infinite. It is one of the most sucky systems in any of the games I have ever played. It is a layout that is incredibly similar, when incredibly similar enemies just repeated at infinitum. Um, and while it has a unique boss at the end, as one of the rarest achievements in the game, it just sucks. If you're going for that achievement, don't do what I did and actually do them. There's a glyph you can type in. I'm gonna see if I can find the video and link it in the description that just that takes you directly to the boss. You have to complete that like, challenge dungeon, which can be a little bit challenging. But once you've completed that, you can just go to the boss and get the Queen of Yarnum, you know, achievement. And I'm mentioning that because that is going to save you like 6-7 runs through challenge dungeons and that is absolutely worth it. Because challenge dungeons suck, quite frankly. Not only do they disrupt the general gameplay and the masterful levels of Bloodborne, but they also outright ruin the rest of the game through making you so extremely overpowered. It is not even funny how overpowered they make you. Because you get, obviously, the upgrade material, like the souls for this game, the plot files from this, or plot fails, I think they're called, from this, right? So you get this from just running them again and again, and since you have to do a lot of them, you'll end up having quite a few. You'll end up being fairly high level when you're done with that achievement, and if you do what I did, and did it as the last thing for your playthrough, and then went to the final bosses, it means that those two final bosses are actual jokes. You are gonna obliterate them quite frankly, and I don't think that's too much fun, so there you go. I think it ruined, sort of ruins the game through that. However, now that we have been negative, and to be fair, there are good things, it does, it does give you a way to farm that is slightly more interesting than just farming the same area, and so on. Like, there is some positives, but I think the majority of the things with that system, the challenge dungeons, are negative. Moving swiftly on though, talking about another new mechanic, we have the weapon transform system. I played a lot with free weapons, I've seen the other's transformation, I did equip them once or twice and tried to use them, but the free that stood out to me that I completed in time, like basically all my runs with, is specifically speaking the Burial Blades, the Shika Kaka from my, first from my first run, and then I couldn't help myself, but I used Lockwick's Holy Blade for my last. And they were all, this was obvious new game 1, 2, 3. Okay, plus one, two, three. So the bosses and whatnot also got stronger. So keep that in mind. Now, I have to say, 
The transformations on these weapons are just fantastic. The Shikakaka being the katana that I completely butchered the pronunciation of, but don't worry about that, has this thing where if you stop it into its holder and you're like on your um, hip, you stick it in there and you take it out and has this giant blood line that you just hold. And hitting that one deals massive damage and two and more importantly starts draining your HP, but you're also doing a lot of more damage while having that active. For my second playthrough, I used the Burial Blade because it's a giant scythe in, in a Bloodborne game. I mean, the, do come on, what do you want me to do? Say no to the giant scythe in an Eldritch Horror game? No, that's not happening. I think scythes are cool, one, and two, the moveset is kind of fucking awesome, and it can turn itself into a sword. It starts out as being this two-handed sword, and then you have a big-ass scythe afterwards, and it's fucking cool. It is great for Atlia, and the sword is just good for damage overall. And lastly, I did Lovric's Holy Sword. Be my absolute favorite weapon in this game, out of the ones that I played with, including the starter Hunter's Axe. This, to me, is peak weapon design. It starts out as being a normal longsword, and then it can transform into a greatsword, which nothing too cool about that, you know, it, it is what it is. But here's the thing that makes it fucking dope. In comparison to a lot of like the bigger weapons, where you can infuse them with, you know, your different materials, so you can add fire damage to them, you can do this and that and everything like that. With this one though, with Lovex Holy Bait, you can just fucking smear that thing in fire and do massive dick damage. It is insane how good that sword is. That thing slaps hard. I adore it. It is my favorite. Lovex Holy Blade, my beloved. I absolutely adore that sword. It is great. And I think the entire system is, as it allows you to, you to basically play with whatever weapon that you want and transform it in any way that you want. Well, not any way, but in the, like, the way that the weapon works. To make it into something entirely different, and that generally gives you an entirely different playstyle. And not just to a small degree, but to, like completely changes the way you play the game. And the last mechanic that you've likely heard about as well is the healing system in Bloodborne. For one, there are the vile blood, blood vials that like drop and you can use them essentially as your Estus Flash. They are not replenishable, meaning that if you rest, they don't come back. You have to farm them every time or just buy them from the vendor, which is what I did. And they are really, really, really dope because you can, in theory, if you're good enough, continue throughout the entire game while still just having the maximum amount of them without doing a new, like, no head run or anything like that, because you can just keep getting them if you just don't die. And what makes that even more possible that somebody actually plays like that is the healing system itself, because in Bloodborne, if you take damage, there's a short while where if you then counter attack or, like, go in and do a lot of damage, you heal that health back, which means you can have this constant effect of you using a little bit of health, then you heal that back, then you lose a little bit of health, then you heal that back, and you just continue like that. I've cleared out entire areas like that just because I could keep that cycle going time and time and time again. And I think that is amazing. It is peak design for these games because in Dark Souls 1 and 2, you might have played a little bit more slow, like especially in Dark Souls 1, you, I played with a shield, you know. I was having that shield up and then I was going around with my sword on the other hand. Then I de equipped my shield quickly too and my sword and just slap him once and then back to the shield. Right. But. Bloodborne teaches you exactly the opposite. Shields, no, ah, -uh. don't maximum out with fucking damage. Yes, yes, yeah. That is what you want in Bloodborne because that's the way you heal. That is the essentially essential to how you survive. And here's the thing. Here's what makes it even better: parrying. In all of the other games, you needed a shield, or not exactly a shield. We need a knife, a shield, something that you could parry with. In Bloodborne, they replace that shit. They're like, shields are for nerds, they're for losers. You know, just have a gun. Like, dodge this, you filthy casual. And you pull out your flint block handgun and just shoot them in the body. And that opens them up for a parry where you then go in and have the most visible parry animation I swear to god I've ever seen. It is satisfying as hell to see the character go in, just stab the monster 
and throw them to the side. The entire body and a massive chunk of their health, you know, just be moved. Their body gets flung to the side, blood everywhere. It is fucking cool. That's the only word I can describe to say. It is just cool. If you've ever wanted to roleplay an anime character, there you fucking go. It is so, so dope. And that is the main things, in my opinion, that I really like. And here's the thing. Because of the fact that you can play so aggressively in Bloodborne, it had made people realize, especially at the time, that you could play that always. It was always something you could do. It's probably I made a point of that in this video as well. But it essentially teaches you not just how to play Bloodborne well, but how to be better at the other Souls games, conversely, which makes them more fun. If I hadn't seen videos on Dark Souls 2 and didn't know about the series for a long, long time before playing, I probably wouldn't have had the runs I did. I wouldn't be playing the way I did. I'd be hiding behind the shield because that's what I did in Dark Souls 1. But Dark Souls 2 is just not as good of a strategy. And in Bloodborne, there are no shields. There are like two, and that's it. And they're both like meat upon. Fuck them. Play with your gun, shoot the shit out of your enemies, parry them, stab them, murder them. That is the way you should go ahead and do it. And it has taught me to do that in Dark Souls 3, especially, which I've started to play now. So, let's move on to the story because I could keep running in circles about it. When it comes to the story and law of Bloodborne, Bloodborne does a lot of things really right. Specifically in the sense that it is Eldritch Horror Dark Souls. And Eldritch Horror Dark Souls is something that does, doesn't sound appealing, it is something that sounds amazing. That means that a lot of the stories while still being sad and still being miserable essentially, in the sense that they may, literally made you sad to read, are still great stories and they still fit in with the theme. However, they have an Eldritch theme to them. And if you don't know what Eldritch Horror is, it is the fear of the unknown summed up into like a very, very short term. But they never quite reveal the monster, the scary thing to you. Bloodborne is that, but you can actually find the fucking horror, right? Being the moon presence and knowing that there are more of something like them out there, that you are small, that you are insignificant in this world. And in terms of stories they're still sad everybody knows about the quest where you have to help a little girl fight her mom you find her mom dead killed by her dad in a fit of insanity during the hunt he was a hunter she went out looking for him even though she wasn't supposed to forgot a music box which could bring him back to his senses because he's already infested with this hunted blood right and here's the thing he kills her you pick up her dress to bring back to the girl, and once you bring it back, you get a choice, you know, you can send the girl somewhere else. And here's the thing, regardless of your choice, that little girl will end up dying, either by somebody else's hand, or because you set her to a place that killed her. So the, she will die. Same thing goes with Gurnam of the first, the first hunter, the first guy you meet, or well, one of the first NPCs you meet in Bloodborne. He's the old man that's sitting in a wheelchair. The essential story behind him, and I'm gonna go over it in the shortest terms, and I recommend you looking this up yourself, because I don't do it justice here. His story is essentially something like this. Lawrence, one of his colleagues, somebody he looked up to make a deal with the moon presence, that if, you know, he got some power, he could have essentially a child. That child was girl. Gurnam wasn't a child at the time, however, whilst he wasn't a child, he agreed to it because he had this amazing respect for his mentor. Now he's locked in there. When you find Lawrence, Lawrence is a monster. That power turned Lawrence into a monster, and Gurnam has clearly been there for a long, long time. And that, you can see that in the arena and everything else because of the sheer amount of tombstones everywhere, all representing a hunter that came through just like you, finished all of the monsters just like you, and accepted the deal at the end and got freed. Gurnum wants the same freedom, so if you fight him and win, you take his place. Essentially the fight not being the hardest in the game, but this music playing in the background, this beautiful like, song, is essentially you 
attempting to free him while he's fighting desperately to free you, to make sure you don't have to go through the same torture that he's do, you know, going through. And this theme of sadness and hopelessness and miserability is something that comes up again and again and again. Now I'm sure you know about the secret ending where you get to fight the actual like moon presence after killing him. Um, and while I, I I don't know what the fuck is going on with that, okay? I don't, what do you want from me? I'm not a law expert here. But essentially if you kill that, you get turned into a great one yourself, a child of one. And through that, the law of Bloodborne just sort of keeps going in that. It is still the same, well, quite frankly, sad Dark Souls storytelling. With minimal happiness, minimal anything like that. And it is still fucking amazing here. Here it just has the tint of HP Lovecraft, of Eldritchness, of Eldritch Horror, and I adore it. It is perfect. And it is really well made. So let's talk about the themes and what this means. At least to me, because let's be real, meaning is subjective and it can mean one thing for me and mean an entirely different thing for you. So what I'm saying isn't necessarily the only truth. Seek out your own meaning, take inspiration from this, talk about what you want to talk about yourself, and you know, I find it amazing that you're still here, quite frankly. Now, when it comes to the general themes about Dark Souls and Souls Likes in general, they tend to be that of hopelessness and of failure and so on. Like I've made the point many times in the past, and I'll continue to, I think the point especially with something like from Soft Souls, like it's also that community journey, that green togetherness that those brings. But I think a theme here could be unadulterated, pure anger. Just absolutely hammering your enemies through aggressiveness to the maximum seen in, again, almost every aspect of the game. How the game is much more fast, how every enemy is much more brutal when you're fighting, how literally every fucking mechanic is built around that, from the healing to the combat to everything else. Everything feels like it's built for that aggressive combat. And that in and of itself is really good, and it's a huge positive for Bloodborne. In the same way that Dark Souls 1 and 2 did that oppressive, really like sad feeling super well, the hopelessness in Dark Souls 1 and 2 was perfect, just like the aggressiveness in Bloodborne. Because Bloodborne's world doesn't feel quote unquote hopeless, there is a good ending. If you accept it and you get like the quote unquote good ending where you wake up after the hunt, then the world just continues to snowman and that's another day and you're essentially free yarn for the night. And you know, while well, yes the cycle is doomed to repeat, then it isn't necessarily gonna. So, you know, positive ending, yay! Then I think a lot of the, the story of Bloodborne can be described as such. It is fairly good usually, and the themes can really more or less be summed up as just being that. So, Lastly here, now that we're sitting on the end of this longer video, I do want to talk about what Bloodborne does so well, my conclusion if you so will. For me, one of the big things about Bloodborne and Souls in general, especially from Soft Souls, is how the way you play the other Souls games directly go in and influence the way that you play the older Souls games. As an example, people who play Bloodborne Generally speaking, become much more aggressive going forward. I have seen that trend in myself because Bloodborne taught me to play like that. Just like people who have parried a lot in Sicker will become much better at parrying than the other games because this is, in a way, sort of all related on a skill curve level. Like, if you can play one, you'd like to play the other ones as well because they are fairly similar. And Bloodborne is no exception. It doesn't just elevate itself to an insanely high degree, it elevates every game that's come before and after it. Because the way that I play Dark Souls, the way I play Elden Ring and so on, is influenced by the way I play Bloodborne. If I haven't seen that aggressiveness, I probably wouldn't have been as aggressive in the other games. I would have thought that a shield is a good idea, which it isn't, right? Or at least not necessarily a good idea. And that can be repeated for basically every From Soft Souls like out there and I think that's a really fucking cool concept. The fact that you can take what you learn in one game and apply it elsewhere is honestly really cool and it takes a special kind of talent to be able to elevate you know and lift up not just 
one game away, one really good game, but maybe a game that's so good that it actually elevates everything else that's come before and after it. And Bloodborne is exactly that. It is so good that it's not just influenced, but quite literally made the previous and future games better because of it existing. its existence. And I'm really happy that it exists because it is really fucking fun and it is really that good. And like I said, I think that is at the end of the day the best way about Bloodborne. It's how it takes other games and makes them better as well. Making it not just a good game, but a game that transcends just the normal category of being a good game into something that's greater than that. A game that is so good that it takes the rest of the series and makes them better as well. I kind of wait until I can go back and play more of Dark Souls 1 at some point in the near future. I want to play some of the mods and what they're them, and I'm sure the way that I play those are going to be influenced by how I played Bloodborne. That being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do the YouTube stuff. Like, comment and subscribe. I'm going to ramble a little bit here at the end. So if you don't want to hear that, you're more than welcome to sign off. As always, your time is more than enough for me. And the fact that you wanted to spend it here means so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful evening or day, depending on where you are. You are absolutely fucking awesome for making it this far. If you want to hear my rant, you can continue here. So, I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't think I'd have this video out as fast as I did. And while I'm happy that I did, I do think I might have to take longer between videos nowadays because I have a girlfriend now and she takes up a lot of my spare time as well along with the MMA I do and along with everything, you know. There's like a lot of things that takes up time. School especially has also started to ramp up. I'm in my second semester and there's, it's just gonna get busier and busier from here. So I think I might have to take some more time between my uploads. That being said, I also do want to dip my toes into streaming and I might do that with the upcoming Destiny 2 expansion, the final shape, and do it again with Shadow of the Earth Tree when that comes out this summer. And I'm absolutely looking forward to that. I do also want to experiment with some different content styles. I'm thinking something along what Iron Pineapple does with his, you know, Steam Dumpster Dive series. I'd like to try that. I'd also like to just try to play some H.io games and see some weird new small concept, play some game jams or whatever. And there's been a lot of ideas floating around my head. If you have anything that you'd like me to cover, any ideas going forward, you know, let me know. I'll still be doing these like longer videos on video games that I enjoy while I'm just talking about them. And I'll continue to do that because I love it. But I do want other things that we can spice the formula up with so it doesn't just become the same thing over and over repeated at infinitum forever. Because if it does that, it'll also be a little bit boring, both for me creatively, but also for you, I feel like. And I mean, there are a lot of things that I want to give my toes into and try, and we'll see how things pan out. But for now, thank you so much for your time. I absolutely adore every single one of you. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.